Um, hello, I'm Dr. Fred Weinbaum, the Chief Medical Officer and Chief Operating Officer of Stony Brook Southampton Hospital. I'd like to welcome you to Focus on Stony Brook Southampton Hospital. Today we have as a very special guest Dr. Alex Aponte. Dr. Aponte is the Medical Director at West Hampton Primary Care and in addition he's the Medical Director of our Wellness Center at the hospital. He is an assistant professor of uh, clinical medicine, uh, clinical family medicine for Stony Brook, and uh, he's here to talk to us about uh, West Hampton Primary Care. Welcome, Dr. Aponte. Thanks for having me. Alex, tell, tell me a little bit about yourself and what your training is and what does it take to be a family doctor and what does a doctor, family doctor do? Um, a lot of my training and my passion for medicine is based on prevention. Um, I like to try to figure out what a person's weakest part is. Uh, you're only as young as your oldest part is a cliche that I use sometimes. And um, the role of a family doctor is basically to earn the trust of their patients and to guide them through the trials and tribulations of all life processes uh, from birth till um, death. And having um, experience with both pediatrics and adult medicine, a lot overlaps and I feel like the family doctor is at a big advantage to use um, their experiences to keep people happy and healthy and to be um, present and engaged in their lives. Well, it sounds like family medicine then is kind of the cradle to grave type of care where you're able to provide uh, meaningful input as well as uh, programmatic uh, uh, decision making to help people stay well. Uh, what, what type of training do you need to be board certified in family medicine? Um, you need to complete medical school and most family medicine residencies are three years long where you do primarily an internship that's in the hospital with sick patients going from CCU to ICU to internal medicine floors with a continuity clinic um, that's your office hours that starts in the first year and will continue uh, into your further years of training and the idea is that you're exposed to patients in the outpatient setting and that they become your patients and you know them, they know you. And that tends to be the best outcomes for patients um, um, globally in that when their doctor knows them and uh, they know their doctor, to be able to identify what's not right in the situation. It's um, statistically very helpful to see your primary care doctor three times a year, uh, more than twice a year in outcomes of death and hospitalizations. So as a, a family medicine doctor at West Hampton Primary Care, you do four years of medical school, three years of residency, and although you're passing competitive examinations all along the way in order to get a state license, you then have to take further examinations to be board certified in family medicine. You have to have continuing medical education where you're keeping up with the newest meds, procedures, training, um, treatments, um, other modalities and we're trying to emphasize just healthy lifestyles because um, having a prescription pad and a scalpel are very helpful but a lot of times the the tough uh, sal is to get the person to stop smoking cigarettes or start exercising right. or not overdo a lot of the things that people sometimes overdo. Right. Well, I'm going to have to get you later to help convince me about the exercising business, so thank you for that. Um, what I think you're uh, really talking about is this lifelong commitment to learning and education. And it sounds like you've made that commitment to reflective learning and self-education. Uh, I know you're always uh, taking courses and trying to improve 
Um, how would you say medicine has changed? Has it changed ra radically in the last 20 years? I see it's changed uh, dramatically in the past 10 years, I would say, where there's much more emphasis on the person um, globally. Uh, there's new, newer concepts that have been around, but they're actually being instituted. Palliative care for somebody who's got multiple chronic illnesses that still want to be treated, and they're in pain, or they're confused, or they're uh, depressed, or frightened, and uh, where somebody's actually listening to the person instead of having the cardiologist take care of the heart and the Right. Gastroenterologists take care of the stomach problems, but what we do in family medicine is we're often asked to um, put in our opinion as to where the person should go from here. Um, a rheumatology patient is uh, being um, offered a biologic agent, and the person didn't fully understand what that means. So a lot of times somebody will come and sit with us just to say, okay, explain this to me in English. You know, what are my risks? Right. What are my, um, what's the downside? What's the upside? So you have to kind of be the quarterback and you're explaining the plays to your players so that they can understand how to get from here to there and do so in the safest and best way possible. Sounds like you've got this tremendous commitment to lifelong learning. But I understand there's also a commitment you have to teaching, and that right now uh, West Hampton Primary Care is a site where we not only teach young residents, but also medical students from Stony Brook. T tell me a little bit about that and what your role is in the education of residents and in the education of students. So I've been sort of, um been spearheading the primary care rotation for the Stony Brook students from Stony Brook and they're coming uh, two at a time uh, to our center and um, it's uh, really um, fun and interesting to ask questions because in medical school these are third year students so They've had 16 to 24 months of hard science where they've learned the biochemical pathways, the anatomy, the physiology, the pulmonary physiology, what the cancer looks like under the microscope, all these things, but they haven't had to put it together with a person coming in presenting with a complaint or they wanted to have a physical. So it's fun to watch and um, guide the students to um, be able to start putting it together. You know, tell me the story. The person comes in, they've had a, a pain for two weeks, they've had a history of something else, and you know, it's really fun and a two-way street because I always um, insist that the medical student teach me something and sometimes mm -hmm. they're intimidated by that fact, but they're very close to the hard science and all the lectures. Uh, so I like to uh, always learn something from them as well as my teaching to them. It's how like, to that, like that song from The King and I that, you know, we're, we're always taught by those we teach? Yes, and some of their questions have been spectacular, um, really thought-provoking, and a lot of times I get caught where I, I don't know how to answer it quite, but that gives us a homework assignment, and right. um, we need to be able to um, go through the case and have some closure on it. You know, I, I think an old professor of mine once said that you never really know a topic in medicine until you can explain it and teach it to uh, a, either a young medical student or a non-medical personnel. Or a ten-year-old. Yeah. You have to be able I, to I kind of slipped me. trying to say that, so the students said that, oh, so you're calling me a grade <laughs> schooler. And that wasn't quite my intention, but um, that's the way it came across. Yes, you have to be able to explain it where it's understood, and you have to be able to explain it to the patient. And our medical students are going to have to explain why we want to keep the patient's sugar down to the patient each time. And I think that, um, you know, patients and 
we as an institution understand the benefit of that because if we don't engage those young medical students at an impressionable time, it's very easy for them to be uh, directed towards uh, super specialization and what the country needs, what we need, what our local communities need are more family doctor quarterbacks who can really take us through the process of, uh, of um, childhood, adolescence, uh, adulthood, and aging and keep us uh, in the best possible condition uh, that we can be. And you're one of those doctors, and that's, that's great. And what I hear from the medical students is that, you know, you're kind of an inspiration to them to enable them to think about primary care as a choice. We talk about primary care and the need for primary care medicine. Uh, talk to me about what primary care really means to you. Um, it's engaging the patient to um, help them help themselves uh, throughout the life process. Um, it all starts with, um, you know, the insurance companies are finally starting to figure out that when someone signs up and sees their primary care doctor um, and has an established place to go when they're not feeling well, that they end up saving money in the long run. So right. it's hard to get this that um, to, a lot of times patients are frustrated with costs and filling out the paperwork and the computer and why did I answer this question and why do they keep asking me my date of birth? So a lot of times I sort of apologize about the technology and all the questions and everything, but putting it back on them would actually doing this for you. Um, there's been a lot more um, oversight from the federal government, the insurance companies, uh, forcing the doctors to uh, have checklists of things. There's a Medicare annual wellness exam that um, at first I felt was intrusive. However, after going through it a couple hundred times, you unfold the person's having some cognitive difficulties. The person's actually having some trouble getting up out of a chair. The person's actually didn't get a colonoscopy and they had a polyp and it's been five years and it would be a very good idea right. to recheck right. because things like colon cancer are 100 percent preventable so just that sit down discussion that you're here to prevent problems and to address whatever is going on with you now um, so that they don't become a life-threatening issue or um, a big problem down the line. In teaching the medical students, I'll often say, well, what we want to do is prevent a life-changing event, stroke, heart attack, undiagnosed cancer, undiagnosed untreated depression, anxiety, undiagnosed alcoholism or uh, drug abuse, so that if you don't ask, a lot of times right. some of these more delicate things are not volunteered. It's true, you know, a famous physician, uh, Francis Peabody, said that the secret of the care of the patient is caring for the patient. And what it sounds like you're talking about is that although uh, you initially saw the checklists and all the clicks and things you had to do for uh, the requirements of third parties as potentially being intrusive, you also were able to ultimately see the benefit and understand how it fit into caring for the patient. And that's, a, that's an important leap. It seems like a necessary exercise to get to A to B uh, because the doctors do kind of have a, we, no one has a complete crystal ball on exactly how everything's gonna go, but you have a pretty decent idea that if this goes untreated, and also to give the patient options on no treatment, what I would suggest, what we can try as a compromise, right. and just to have a, um, <clears throat> a discussion. You know, it sounds like you work with patients to try and enable them to achieve their goals of, one, being educated about their illnesses, uh, two, being told about what it takes to keep them well, and three, allowing them some self-determination with regards to the interventions that need to be done. 
uh, I think as a patient, that's truly what you really want. Um, talk to me about what some of those requirements for technology that, that patients see and maybe don't understand. Uh, you know, there's this word macra out there, the um, and MIPS and all these acronyms. Uh, what does that mean? What does it mean to you? The um, the what, these things which Medicare calls value-based payment, but which really means um, to you that certain amount of data has to be collected and certain results have to be achieved. Um, how do we do that in West Hampton? Um, we have a care management team that has been very helpful. Um, we have a very smart uh, nurse and LPNs that um, assist us with some of the more complicated patients. There's a, a condition that I can um, say that if somebody has uncontrolled diabetes, is at full risk, and has been depressed, I can ask care management to become involved. And what does that do for the patient? That patient will get a call once a month. Hi, do you need any prescriptions refilled? Is there anything going on with you? Uh, do you have, have you seen any specialists since we last saw you? Just so that there's no fragmentation in the person's care. These care managers are also involved with if somebody's hospitalized, they're called saying, I hear you're in the hospital, we wanna see you three days after you come out, we have an appointment available for you, which is a big leap because you know even five, 10 years ago, none of the doctors had an appointment for two months. So this person would be coming out of the hospital, their medications have been changed, they don't know what they're on and why they're having these medications, or I didn't want to take that med because my neighbor told me not to. You know, it, it, sometimes it's as simple as, as going over, no, you really need this medicine because you've had a pneumonia and it's not completed until the antibiotic course is completed so that you don't get it back with a resistant organism that um, hits you even harder. So um, it's enhanced communication between the people who need the most care and the primary care office. So it works as a team between primary care office, hospital specialists, ancillary services like physical therapy, um, pain management, the whole um, I think what you're, spectrum. What you're pointing to is something I think the viewers and I and everyone who's been involved in healthcare has from time to time experience. There is a real potential for discoordination of care. And if a special effort is made to coordinate care, that means that if a patient has been in the hospital and has been acutely ill and has an acute episode of illness that requires hospitalization, when they get discharged, it's extraordinarily important for them to contact and be seen by their primary caregivers in the community within a relatively short period of time. To know what happened. To know what happened. And hopefully so it doesn't happen again. And to make sure that the medications are being taken as prescribed. It's easy to come home with a new prescription, to have an old bottle of pills, and to be confused about what you should be taking, right? Or, or even so, even sometimes the prescription oh, that prescription was $280, I can't pay for that. And you don't a find out issue. unless the person's in the office, sorry, we couldn't get that medication. Is there anything else you can prescribe? Because the person isn't gonna contact the hospital saying, oh, this medication's too expensive. It really gets left to the primary care doctor to uh, pick up the ball and take it running from there. So within this legislation that had been passed, the, uh, what was it, Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization um, MACRA, that um, included something which provided med certain incentive payments, Medicare incentive payments, that allowed uh, 
physicians to be able to see their patients shortly after discharge and obtain uh, the type of reimbursement necessary for that sometimes uh, colossal effort. The second piece, which I think is really interesting, and that's something that um, I know you're doing in, uh, in West Hampton, is what's called the patient-centered medical home. And that's exactly what you were describing, that care coordination that being the center for the patient where they can rely upon you to help direct their care. Uh, tell me, how, how does PCMH, it's called Patient-Centered Medical Home, how does that work in West Hampton? Well, we've been PCMH certified, which um, is a lot of um, data mining, letters to go out to reminder, making sure that if a woman has a prescription for a mammogram, it's done a lot of coordination between the computers and the lab and interfaces that's all highly complicated because of privacy laws uh, and things along those lines. Um, so it's a lot of work, but like we said, when you're making sure that the person got seen after hospitalization, their chances of doing well go up exponentially. If they can't get an appointment for three weeks, the chances of something going wrong right. are very high. Um, have, you, have you seen when patients come in for that visit within 72 hours of hospitalization, issues with medication reconciliation? Of course. Um, that's one of the biggest issues is that um, people often don't understand why they're on a medication, what it's for, what was substituted. So, in, especially with the medical students, I try to always write that this medication is for blood pressure. Right. This medication is a water pill for blood pressure. This medication is for diabetes. Uh, this medication is to prevent anxiety. Right. Um, because when you're on 10, 15 medications, it can be very overwhelming, uh, both to the patient and to the family. And we also try to only prescribe medications when it's necessary. And that's part of that reconciliation. Okay, why are they on that? Avoid polypharmacy. No, no one knows why they're on possible, it. Okay, sure. so then we stop it. Um, Great. You should have a clear understanding as to why, because the medications can have side effects. And I just always try to throw in, uh, so, uh, you know, what's your favorite exercise? Are you... Um, you know, bummed out about this hospitalization. You know, how are you doing? You recently been hospitalized, it wasn't fun. Are you okay? And um, people will tell you, yeah, I'm fine, or? So West Hampton Primary Care qualifies as something called a level three patient-centered medical home. That qualification, as you've explained, requires a certification uh, by uh, external quality agency that says that the quality of care you're delivering meets that very high standard. Um, in doing so, you've got care coordinators who are working not only to be sure that patients after an acute episode of illness get back to see you and make sure that the care is correct, that their medications are right, that their specialty visits are going to occur when they need them on time, and thereby avoid subsequent re-hospitalization. But also, there's something within that about chronic disease management. Talk to me a little bit about what does it take to manage someone with severe chronic disease, chronic illness? How do you do it in West Hampton? I think we do a, a good job on a very challenging issue um, because when people have a lot of different problems, it's sort of like, um, you know, you put your finger in one hole and then another <laughs> one spots out and uh, almost to uh, try and help the family anticipate um, right. that um, this is challenging. Um, we all will face um, our end at some point and we try to um, keep in mind that there's a person there all the time and also when you're coming down to the end where you're having multiple multiple issues um, to um, 
to be there for them and to just understand that we're going to try to help you throughout no matter what. Um, if you get anxious, we'll, we'll help you with that. If you have pain, we can help you with that. And um, to, although it's different than patient-centered medical home, uh, the flip side of it is to not always pay attention to the guidelines. For instance, cholesterol medication should be discussed if you're over 75. If the person is really, you know, exercising, fine, mm -hmm. their cholesterol is very high, they have a very strong family history of arterial disease, you know, so what, they're 75. They're a very young 75. Right. Or sometimes the opposite. They've got a cancer going on, you know, they're having some memory issues. Um, do we really need the cholesterol medication now at 81 years of age? <laughs> Probably not. So, so um, guidelines are helpful, but but not need to, to be, be tempered done by rigidly. And exactly. sometimes you get announcements like aspirin should not be given over 75. You read the study, you go over it. Um, yes, there's, um, if there are a fall risk or a bleeding risk, um, that it wasn't found to be overly protective for the heart. Um, so just to have the discussion. So the medicine does have some art to it still. It's not all science, there's a great deal of art. And the one thing I know from having heard from your patients is they, they really appreciate the art that you bring to it. And one of the things you really bring to that table is a focus on wellness. Tell me a little bit about your focus on wellness and what you do there. Um, like I said previously, you're only as young as your oldest part. And sometimes, um, we get a little caught up with this medication and that specialist and where um, no one sort of stops and says, well, you know, really your, your relationship is toxic. <laughs> you know, you got to get out of it because you're not going to really get too far. And sometimes just what I call it is the, um, you know, the gaping hole or the right. missing leg on the table, like a person exercises, they eat well or anything, but they're smoking cigarettes. Or um, they're exercising, they're eating right, but their, their thyroid just crapped out, and they really need thyroid hormone because they're gaining weight, they're constipated, they're sad, they're tired, um, and they're just not functioning, and they feel like taking a medication is that they're not trying hard enough. So a lot of times you kind of just um, try to explain that, right. you know, some medications are our friends. Thyroid hormone is actually a natural hormone. It's not like you're introducing a, a, a foreign medication to the person. So it's just um, explaining what you're hoping that uh, your experience in that if they follow what you're suggesting, they'll be stronger and happier for it. Alex, I've really enjoyed this chat that we've had together. And if, if I had to summarize it, I'd say that uh, one of the things that you and West Hampton Primary Care focuses on is patients' overall well-being, care of a patient from youth to adulthood to old age, uh, the management of people with significant chronic illnesses in a holistic fashion, as well as the provision of the best possible care uh, for preventive medicine. So I think uh, it's been an outstanding time to know that, uh, that you're doing such a great job, both learning, teaching, and being a role model for our students uh, and future physicians. I'd like to thank you, Alex, for, Thanks for having me. being on our team. And I'd like to let everyone know that they can call uh, Dr. Aponte or call West Hampton Primary Care at 631-288-7746. Uh, and of course, our phone number at Southampton, Stony Brook Southampton Administration uh, can always be reached, 631-726-8555. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the audience for taking the time and spending the time with us, as well as to CTV for allowing us to present this focus on Stony Brook Southampton Hospital. Thanks to the cameraman and thanks to our audio person. Thanks to all of you.